forget, you can hear the full-length, longer version wherever you get your podcasts. I'm uh, just telling the coffee-reaching Alistair Petrie how just minutes ago in that chair was Alfie Bow. Who knows which order these will go out in, but Al, Alfie sang for me. Mm. Uh, he delivered. Mm. I will get there with a little light encouragement and maybe a small stipend. Oh, class. You just can't, you can't. I don't think it's classy. I'm just, just pay me basically and I'll do anything you want. But that voice, <laughs> you've got a lovely voice. That, make, that makes anything oh, sound classy. Passing this on to my voiceover agent very quickly. Very mm, quickly. Very quickly. Just yeah. try this for me. Mm. See in store for details. See in store for details. Terms and conditions apply. Oh. But you've got to say it very quickly. Have you had to do that where you've got to say it super fast? But normally, do, or do they get someone else to do it? I've done everything. Have you? I've done everything. Gavis gone cool. What a feeling. <laughs> Is it a feeling? I've never tried it. Haven't you? Apparently. It'll come to you, dear. It'll come to you. The need for Gavis gone. How did it begin for you? Um, I, it's, it's actually, it's, it, it's, it's a very good question. It's a very good question because I figured, I think I figured. It's an unusual question, isn't it? Well, it, it is. It's not it, a it question isn't. that gets no, it's asked an unusual very answer because I've got a very recent it's an answer. original so question, Very isn't quickly. It? it began because, um, the, what may be a slightly apocryphal false memory, but I don't think it is, that my dad was in the services. So he moved a lot. Mm. Um, and so I moved erratically, erratically, mm. he moved very erratically, which is dangerous when you're a fighter pilot. When you say that, you don't mean as he would walk. You no. mean moving house, moving house every right. sort of three years. Yeah. And so I trolleyed on behind him with my sis. And uh, so lots of new schools, all mm. of that stuff. Tom and, Cruise had uh, a similar beginning. Tom Hanks did too. All the Toms. All the Toms did. Mm. Tom. Hollander. <laughs> God, there must be more. Um, Oro and and tomorrow and tomorrow. <laughs> Tom, Tom Oro and tomorrow. Tomorrow and tomorrow. is very good. Uh, and I saw my mother when I was six years old. She got cheap for the first time. <laughs> it's a sad story. Could you cry? <laughs> It'll help our figures. Do you have any stick? What do they use that stuff? No. Um, I saw my mother on stage in a um, production of Toad of Toad Hall, Amateur Dramatics. In Germany. And, and when I saw her on stage, she uh, had this one line, which was, he called me fat face. That was the line. And the entire theatre uh, burst out laughing. And as a six-year-old, I think, well, I remember where I was sitting. And I remember looking around just going, what is this magic? Because everyone was laughing. Really? Now, so far, How so lovely. romantic. How lovely. But I, um, I had to do a speech at a school. I didn't have to. They asked me. And I said, yes, because act with a mic is... It's a dream scenario. Um, a sort of a leavers, inspirational, have some, you know, all that. And uh, Is this a school that your children had attended one of my or sons just a had, random school? One, I just walked in and said, I've got something to say. Um, no, I'm an actor. <laughs> I, I wonder, Listen you, here, you might like to nine me to... minutes, I don't think so. Would you like me to address the children? And parents and staff. Uh, big house. Uh, and... The question was, I was asked a question afterwards. I said, why, or beforehand, and the question was, um, did you always know you wanted to be an actor? You'll have had that question a million times. Yeah. Did you always know? And the answer was yes. I, that's a yes. But I'd never been able to really answer the question, why did you always want to be an actor? And I genuinely didn't have an answer for it. I'd sort of darted around a bit and thought, well, I, there was no one in my family. It wasn't sort of as though I looked at a parent and gone, well, that looks like fun. Um, and I was looking, I was actually, I think subconsciously I've been looking for that answer. And I think as a result of growing up the way I grew up, quite a <clears throat> peripatetic growing up um, existence, that actually when I found at each school, I found my tribe. And I think it was the kind of the theatre kids. It wasn't yeah. the sporty kids, it was the theatre yeah. kids. And I think actually it got so ingrained in me that once I found my tribe, I felt safe. Mm -hmm. And I think that is the answer. Why did I always want yeah. to do it? Because, because it makes me feel safe. Well, and that was you... genuinely a revelation about 10 days ago, therapists write in now. About 10 days ago you genuinely came to Genuinely about 10 days ago. In what circumstances? I was just trying to figure out, I was trying to figure out the answer to that question because I sort God. of knew that... You get asked, you know, did you always know? Answer mm. yes. Why? Mm. And I couldn't answer the question. I went, I don't know. Well, isn't it as simple as it's what made you feel good? Yeah. And, but and I safe. think safe is the word. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And good. And, and accepted and all of that. And dad was a fighter pilot. He was. That's pretty cool. It is pretty cool. But he had no, when I went to he him. He didn't die 16, horribly, did he? And no. get shot down. I'm well, not... he did of COVID, but that's not the same. 
<laughs> <laughs> he was very old and he was very addled with dementia, so it was a merciful release in many ways. Plus, if he'd known, as a, as a, as a full-blown Abaddonian Scotsman, if he'd known how much his care home fees were costing, he would have said, shoot me now. <laughs> he really would. <laughs> All right, let, let, let's edge away from the, the, the tragedy of his death and go back to his glory no, days. What's he like is. growing up with? It? What, what well, does your actually, dad do? He, he's, he's a banker. What does your dad do? He's a plumber. What does your dad do? And young Petri says, oh, he's fighter, fighter pilot. pilot. Uh, he, uh, what was so amazing actually is that he, uh, and I think that's the thing he recognized in me. So when I turned around age 16 and had the courage to tell him that I wanted to be an actor, he uh, didn't have any concept of that at all. Mm. He had no idea. Mm. In fact, his first question to me was, and I take a deep breath when I say this, he said, are you gay? Yes. Um, that thought, would have okay, been my working. first question as well. <laughs> and a very valid one. Mm. Um, but so I thought, okay, we're working from a very low bar here to try and <sighs> explain to my father why it is I want to do what I want to do. So how to convince... Let's, re let's reenact it. I'll be your dad, okay? okay your so, young uh, Alistair. I won't... <laughs> dad, dad, it's... <laughs> That's me, over. Yes, hey, sir. what do you want now, Alistair? Is, is, hey, you're shooting up, aren't you? It's a small thing, but he was from Aberdeen, if he could do the Aberdonian accent. Oh, oh, oh. You're, you're, you're shooting up, Alistair. How are you? <laughs> yes, weirdly, he was 95 years old oh. and I was 16. He was what, like what, Charlie Chaplin. What was he more like, was he? What was he more like? I, I can't do an Aberdeen. I'm just doing Scottish. I wouldn't know what it is. I wouldn't know what it is. He, um... He what actually... do you want now, Alistair? Oh, I'm God, oh, busy. Coming back. I'm thinking about being up in the plane. If you could... <laughs> what do you want? Could you glare with your, your baby browns? Glare, really glare. What is it, we owl? What is it? I want to be an actor. I would, actually, let's say I was 16, maybe yeah. the voice was, I want to be an actor, Dad. I'd love to be an actor. <gasps> Are you gay? Oh, Dad, does it matter? I think it does. Hey. <laughs> and that's where we went from. There's no gay Petris, although one was quite a dish. Petri dish. He likes it. He got a smile. That's you was that, was that, has that. Has that conjured it up for you in a way that's a little um, upsetting? It uh, it does. Or was it, it upsetting does. for different reasons? It was. Uh, it was. Uh, but then, to his full credit, he did turn around and say, "Is it something you really want to do?" He said, "It's not something frivolous." And I said, "No." And he said, "Well, okay then." Good for him. But I still did what I was sort of expected to do from his play. I went to university, but I got thrown out after six months, which is a very. I'm very proud after of. After six months, what yeah. were you reading? I was reading very little, but I was supposed to be reading French and drama. Oh, très bien. Well, French, because I could sort of vaguely do it, and drama was the sort of the... Tro French was the Trojan... Would French be the Trojan horse? Would drama be the French Trojan horse? French would be the Trojan, Trojan horse. horse. Of course. Drama was contained there. Yeah. And why did they chuck you out after six uh, because months? Because I arrived at university having been at an all-boys school in a little village in Berkshire. Oh, God, I've got a horrible feeling where this is going. <laughs> and I went to university, and the day where you go Think to college about your and you start answer signing now, in... Before you give it. All right, I'll take a breath. But I looked around and saw this vast church of magnificent people and just went, I need to get to know all of you so I don't have time to work. I don't have time. I need to consume individuals and people and meet lots of people. Yes. And that's what I did. So I did and know So work. you met a lot of people. I did. And yeah. so you were chucked to just because of your grades? Uh, well, I didn't even get any grades because uh, when it was, when I discovered that you didn't necessarily have to do, turn up to lectures and if you didn't turn up to a lecture, nobody turned around and said, why weren't you at the lecture? I thought, well, right. this is great. Because there's a degree of self-responsibility. Yes, which yeah. I totally denied and ignored. And yeah. so um, I got hauled into my tutor's office, who was called Professor Ricketts. <laughs> he was, and he always wore a suit. <laughs> right. Um, and he called me into his office and said, if you don't get first class results in all your first sort of mid-year exams, which I think were due in the February after I started in the early October, um, I will send you down. And I remember thinking, send me down. That's a very pompous thing to say. This is not Oxford or Cambridge. What are you talking about, man? Um, and I said, okay, fine, fair enough. I took that on board. And I had secretly applied for drama school because that's actually what I, what I wanted to be doing. And the day um, I was, I knew I was in trouble when the results were published. And on the board, the results went up and it was sort of French language one, zero, because I didn't go to it. French language two, 23% results. So I did turn up to that one. Um, and various others that I didn't do very well in. My mother phoned me and said, um, there's a letter arrived for you at home. Uh, and it's got Lambda written on the envelope. And I, she said, do you want me to open it? And I said, is it a thick envelope or a thin envelope? And I thought if it was a thick envelope, there's going to be forms to fill in. And she said, it's thick. 
So I said, open it. So she did, and it said, Dear Alistair, and I have this framed on my wall at home. It said, Dear Alistair, we'd very like to blah, 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 offer you a place on the three-year acting course at Lambda. And not one hour later, I was sitting in Professor Ricketts' um, office at university, and he said, I, I'm looking at your results, and I'm very sad to say I'm going to send you down. I had a light chuckle and said, that's fine because I'm going to Lambda. And I minced out of his um, office with a flourish, I threw my scarf over my left shoulder, uh, leaving him dumbfounded. But then that night, I went to the accommodation to the bar on the, on the university campus, and I got the accommodations officer blind drunk and said, "Would it be okay if I kept my room for the rest of the academic year?" And he said, "Absolutely. I might need it back at some point, but that's not a problem." So then I spent the rest of the year. Um, hanging out at university with my friends and taunting Professor Ricketts across the uh, refectory every lunchtime as he looked at me with that slightly kind of Herbert Lom wink. And it was the greatest year of my life. So he knew that he'd sent you down, yes. as he put it. Yes. And you just weren't going. No, I refused to go because I was having <laughs> too much fun. Did you go to lectures? No, I was, uh, no. I just, I, I rented my room and stayed there and tormented him. And it was the greatest pleasure of my life. But he also he shouldn't have been called Professor Ricketts. It's like some cartoony thing. You're writing a script and you have a mean tutor called Professor Ricketts. Oh, and, he's and probably was he's probably very nice. So you go to Lambda. I do. And act the shit out of it. <laughs> <laughs> did you love it straight away? I did. Yeah, I did. It was uh I, I kind of consumed it. It was um it, I think drama schools then, and I don't I don't mean to be rude about Lambda, but it was sort of a little more in a say sort of ramshackle we were sort of had one small building i mean now it, all these places are very fancy and they've yeah. got lots of money but yeah. um i did and i met the most amazing people a lot of them obviously as you will know will still be you know a friends friends for life and i spent a lot of time i think a lot of it i was quite young when i went i was 19 i think um and so i spent quite a lot of time figuring out who i was um and but i did i consumed i had a ball you finished at lambda yeah you completed the course i did now then some actors, off they go, hey, diddly D, an actor's life for me, mm. some struggle. Mm. How was it for Petri? Well, Petri's first job uh, was actually, I think it was in my last term, oh. and uh, I think a casting director that had seen me on stage just phoned my then very shiny new agent and said, we'd love him to come and do an episode of Poirot. I thought, my God, it's a straight offer. Straight with Suchet? And it was to play student number two. Mm. I forget who student number one was and well, probably quite, still is. Yeah. So I barreled in, I did my day, and it was in a debate about feminism um, I f in, in, a, in a hall, a student hall, which may have university hall. Anyway, so I was planted in the middle of the crowd. And with no screen experience whatsoever, I just assumed that the camera would sort of pan across the crowd. And I sort of sat there regally waiting for my line. And when the <laughs> camera landed on me, while everyone else was around going, hey, 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 giving all that, I sat there as though I was the the, the focal point of the scene. And, uh, and I can't remember the line, but it was brief, but I stood up, said my line and sat down and everyone went, hey! and I, I, I think I had it in my head that I was playing the leader of the university debating society. And I wasn't, I was student two, not even student one. So we shot that and that was fine. And, uh, and, but I was paid, you know, and paid it was, I remember how much I was paid and it was nice. It was like, wow, for one day's work, lovely. And then of course, cut to many months later, I was in my local pub in London and um, it was a Sunday night and it was 9 PM and it was the big, the big show was going to be on the TV in the corner of the pub. And I stood, everyone knew the locals were there going, oh, it's Al's big, big TV debut. So I stood on this pool table with a pool cue. You didn't. I did. And it was coming, everyone, shh, everyone's coming, it's coming, it's coming, it's coming. And student one remained in the episode. Student two, sadly, was cut. And that was my first lesson. And my mother, who was, was just wise about many things, but she was particularly why she said, oh, I tell you what, it's one thing getting a job on television, it's another thing keeping it. And I've always remembered that. Very true. So that was my very first job. You don't know till you've seen the edit. It's you not an actor's know. medium, that telly stuff. <laughs> so that was that. And I don't know if it's still... But that was it. You, you were still at, at college then. Yeah, so it was a bonus paycheck, really. Yeah. It was one day. So you then know. you left college. Left college, and then my very first job was on stage, actually, um, at the Chelsea Centre Theatre, still going strong, directed by Janet Sussman. And that's pretty cool. Yeah. Doing yeah. a Fado farce with the very great Tamsin Gregg. 
Was that when she was married to Trevor Nunn? No, they weren't married. I think she didn't were, mention Trevor then. No, there was no, no, no never mentioned. Trevor. Trevor Beats. None shall speak his name. <laughs> but she, she, None. she worked Trevor as Nunn, very hard. So it's quite, quite she worked clever. as very hard indeed. And was quite. Brilliant. It doesn't matter. Yeah. No, go on. I didn't hear. No, it. you didn't hear. It doesn't no, matter. It's earwax. Terrible. Earwax. Sorry. What? What did you say? About a quarter to three. What? <laughs> Three twenty-three. Yeah, thanks. Did you say about Trevor Nunn? What? None what? shall speak his name. It was a play on words. It wasn't funny. Okay. I just you acknowledge it. It'd be nice. God, it's just so, common courtesy. I think you're just so well read. That's what's what? Sca- I think I'm scared. Yeah, I don't blame you. I think it's fear. It's just fear. Of the stuff that you're doing now, yeah. a few things I want to talk about. Mm. I, anybody with any Star Wars connection, I talked to Harriet Walter the other day. I've talked to Richard E. Grant. Wow. Um, Tell me about the Rogue One experience because Rogue One, that was one of the good, because there have been so many Star Wars films of yeah. late, yeah. some better than others. My memory is that Rogue One is thought of as being one of the, you know, one of the very good ones. Yeah, they had a freedom, I think. The, re- the reason that I got involved was that I got a call from, from my agent just saying, oh, um, Gina Jay is called and Gareth Edwards, who's directing, said he'd love you to be in his film. Um, I was very flattered by that. And I said to my agent, listen, I've got teenage boys. Um, the first film I ever saw in the cinema was um, A New Hope in 1978, uh, early 78, I think it was, when I was a kid. Uh, and I said, I just got two criteria. One, I want to have a line. And, <laughs> and two, uh, low, uh, low ambition. I want to have a line and I want to have a cool name. Yeah. And if those two criteria are fulfilled, I'm good. Yeah. Um, because I thought we can go to the Guildford ABC with my sons and I can point to the screen and go, look at that. Yeah. And... Um, and she got back very quickly and said, yes, you have a name and you have a line and it's a scene. And I went, job done. Happy day. And they said, we'll need you for, I look, and they sent through the couple of pages. And I said, oh, that's half, I said to my wife, it's half a day. Let's do not worry about our two weeks holiday in Cornwall. It'll be fine. If I have to pop up for half a day to shoot this bit, <laughs> it'll be fine. I'm um, cut to working on that film on and off for um, about a year. Why? How? What happened? Because the part kind of got built up and oh, then we were lovely. reshooting stuff. Oh. And then they went, oh, yeah, that's quite an interesting character. It's quite valuable for storytelling purposes. Oh, wow. And, uh, and then they, I mean, it was a, there was, there's a, a multitude of things. The thing I do love about it, I do think that they have um, a love and care for the stories that they want to tell. There is, of course, a vast commercial aspect to it. But I think the people involved do actually care about yeah, 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 you know, yeah. that stuff. Yeah. But I think our budget was sort of based on the lunchbox, pro- lunchbox and merch proceeds of whatever the film came before that. So there was a freedom. And they knew that they could kill people as well because they knew it was going to be a one-off standalone um, piece of you know. So did it story. become a hugely enjoyable experience? It became, yeah, it really was. There was a, of those, and you, I know you've, God knows you've done these, but a lot of those big budget epic films can be a very sort of non-intimate working experience, mm. whereas sort of mm. working on a, a piece of TV in the UK could be mm. much more intimate and, and in a way lots more fun. But it, it somehow retained that kind of intimacy, which was lovely because people on it who were working on it were, were completely delightful. And then there was, there was a, but there was a very strange moment when Tony Gilroy came to do some reshoots. I was changing um, in my trailer and they came charging in with a with a, a, um, a, a empire outfit, you know, those iconic baddies outfits. Yeah. And they were sort of putting it against my back. And because we never got given a script, we were only given the scenes that we were in on the day that we were basically shooting them or maybe the day before so we could have a vague chance of learning it. I just assumed, oh, it was an idea that they were playing with. Uh, we, uh, maybe he's an imperial uh, officer at some point. So while they were fitting me, I was short, fine, didn't even ask any questions. And then a couple of days later, I found myself in makeup and they were putting on a wig. I thought, this is weird. And they were giving me some stubbly beard. And I thought, this is quite odd. Uh, and they said, oh, Al, yeah, we were just wondering, um, could you play Mads Mikkelsen? I was like, I'm sorry, what? Is it, could you play Mads Mikkelsen? It's just that we need to get a reverse on, um, <laughs> we, we need to get a reverse on Felicity. And Felicity has asked and she wanted to call you, but we needed, uh, Felicity wanted to know that it's a very emotional scene. It's basically the death of her father. M- spoiler alert, but it's seven years on, so it doesn't matter. Um, that Mads dies, it's pouring with rain and she didn't want to do it with um, an albeit highly talented essay, I'm sure. But she was wondering if you would do the scene for her because she needs someone half decent to play against. Well, they tell you this once you've got the wig on and they're well, doing the stuff. Well, maybe stubble. it was about an hour before. But, right. I, I, but because it felt like we were sort of, because of reshoots and stuff, and uh, it just felt, sure, in for a penny, in for a pound. Yeah. Um. So I said, sure, I would. So, uh, and it was, I don't know, it, was about, it wasn't a long scene, it was about a page, but it was a big ask of Felicity. And so uh, 
I gave my Mads Mikkelsen. And if you enjoy the film, I re recommend you rewatch it. My left hand, and maybe the slight left side of my jaw, you'll see my hand touch her face in a very emotional... I think I should have won awards for it. But it, it, but I did it partly because I just thought, A, absolutely, I'll do it for Felicity. And B, it did have that semblance of we're making something sort of unique and yeah. kind of a standalone-y, so yeah, what the hell? And I think if it had been a traumatic big budget experience, I would have gone, no, nah, I'm okay, thank it's you. Also, it's also part it's of that hey diddly D, isn't it? An yeah. actor's life for it me. Really, yeah, exactly. Which I think I sense you kind of love that aspect of, of that life. I really do. I really do. So when they sort of say, are you around on Friday? I'm like, sure, I am. I'm a big sort of rollover tick on my tummy Labrador. What about uh, sex education? Yeah. Because that's been a big thing. It's been a big thing. But I think it, it, a show like that goes to um, that thing we slightly touched on earlier, which is you can see the raw material. You read a script and mm. you go, it's a very good script. It's a very good script. And then obviously there's the execution of the script. And then it not being an actor's medium, it goes through the entire process until it's sort of sent out into the world. And I think our overriding sense, given it the first season landed, I think in 2019, which was that, in inverted commas phrase, peak TV, um, where all the streamers were jockeying for position and new launches and stuff, it felt like there was so much content out there that it was... I remember thinking, oh, I just hope this, I th what I think is a wonderful show, finds an audience. That's sort of what mm. we hope for. Mm. Um, and and it it really did. But I think that's an alchemy that, you know, obviously you can't bottle because I don't think anybody knew until it goes out into the world. I mean, it went out on a Friday, you know, all the episodes dropped on the streamer and you just think, let's hope we find an audience. And then it just caught something which was kind of pretty remarkable. And it's been a, it's been a, a complete gift, not least because of, um, you know, as typically on on a sort of successful show and the length of time you do you do it is is the personalities that you yeah. need on it people 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 and how did you how did you come to be in that then did they just come knocking at your door and begging you to appear um because <laughs> that's how it normally please. is isn't it it? it it is offer only mm. um I, uh, offer only for people for people not in the business. <laughs> That's when actors will say they're not going to audition, they're not going to self-tape. It's offer only. Mm. Taking that up another level, I will I won't name who this actor was, a massive actor, and a friend of mine who's a massive director wanted this massive actor to be in this uh film, and the agent of the massive actor said, it has to be a private plane. One A will not suffice. Oh, that's a good, I might use that line. One A will not suffice. So when I check into my flight tomorrow morning, mm. I shall look at uh, my seat, 43B, yeah. and say, 43B will not suffice. Do you have a window seat? Um, <laughs> 12C would be, would be, <laughs> be nice. <perfect. laughs> it's not near the loo. I don't mind. Um, but I, uh, yeah, I was, I was very being very heavily considered to play, um, to take over from Matt Smith and play Prince Philip in The Crown. Wow. Um, and uh, there were a lot of conversations back and forth. And I hadn't, at that point, seen The Crown. was very aware of it. Yes. Um, but I watched it, so I consumed it and loved it um, for a whole bunch of very obvious reasons, in the same way that a lot of other people have adored it, not least Peter Morgan and others writing and directing and performing, all of that. Um, and I got very heavily invested in it. And I, w I very much wanted to sort of investigate that character that person prince philip the more i sort of did some research before i first went into test for it um the more i desperately wanted to, to, to do it um so yeah there were endless conversations that went back and forth back and forth back and forth and i think basically it was tobias or i um and they went with tobias um for all brilliant reasons but i remember feeling pretty distraught because destitute I, sad overlooked i didn't feel overlooked tossed off Definitely not that. Tossed aside. That's the phrase. Um, abandoned, unloved. That's the business. Spurned. Mm, I don't think all of the above, apart from tossed off. Um, and I... Overlooked. I think we had that. That's on the list already. I think that was number six. Rejected. Oh, God, yes. Mm. Oh, that's probably number one. Mm. Mm. Sad. Yeah. So... Um, but uh, whilst celebrating my very good friend Tobias's success, I did text well him and done. say, "Will happily well be your done, valid." Tobias. Be well done. Um, it, uh, I thought, well, that was that. That's that then. And then it was within about forty-eight hours, um, a uh, yeah, an email landed saying, "Have a look at this." 
So those are the way of things. And of course, at the time, you think, oh. Offer only? Uh, meet producer and director. Mm, interesting. No man's land in yeah, between. Yeah, they put the going, do, do they want to read? Mm. Um, but actually, the reason it came about, primarily, as I later found out, is that the first person I think they'd cast in the show, they were seeing a lot of young actors, and they could, because they were mm. obviously casting a very young cast, mm. who had been at drama school, hadn't been at drama school. Um, and a fine young actor, Connor Swindells, had gone in to read for um, Adam, who plays my son. And it wasn't what they were expecting, but he delivered something quite brilliant. And they knew they'd found that Adam, of course, then they're looking for Adam's dad. Right. So, uh, you know, we have similar characteristics. Someone with a hint of Swindells. A little, I, it's a little bit of Swindells. And they're thinking Swindells, Petri. Petri yeah. Swindells. So they were very this, nice this to me works. in the meeting, and I couldn't quite understand why they were so nice to me. Um, and uh, within about an hour, um, they said, we'd love you to do it. Within an hour? Yeah, it was very quick. After you'd left the meeting? Yeah, left the meeting. It was very fast. Oh, indeed. this is idyllic. Yeah. So, um, and as a result, I've had a very happy, happy five years, I think it has been, um, doing this uh, doing this show. Uh, and again, it, just the personalities I've met. So now I look back on um, my uh, my crown experience mm. with uh, with a huge sense of philosophical I was about to say philosophical ennui, but that doesn't make no. any sense at all. No, no. My wife and I have this thing about using big words, and then we always look at each other and go, did I use that in there? I mean, we still don't know. No, with a great sense of a, philosoph a philosophical zhuzh, let's say, mm. um, and mm. go, God, that was, if you want to sort of look at fate or things happen for a reason and mm. all other good spiritual things, you go, well, that was pretty, pretty good. Um, so, yeah, then that gift walked into my life, and here I sit. You could have been. How would you have played Prince Philip? If it was oh. me, I would have been very much spitting image. Eh, what are you doing here? Get out of me, we. <laughs> I would have, oh, I would have gone big. I would have gone theatrical. I would have You gone wouldn't have been massive. as subtle as what I just did then. No, I would have, um, I would have gone full, full royal. <laughs> and <did> you... <laughs> yeah, I put it like I was having Where are you from? Oh, you. Uh, I would have loved to have done it, but I didn't. But I did do what I have done, and I'm very happy about that. So, but you've given us a little glimpse good. behind the curtain. The curtain, the big glitter slash curtain. You've given us a little yeah. look behind the Petri curtain. So a gift, and you've excited us with what well. we've seen. Um, it's been <laughs> lovely talking to you. Um, Thank you. Rob. I wish you success with everything you go on to. On we blood. I say, Alistair Petri. If your dad were here now, he'd say, "Well done, Alistair. You did really well." I feel very moved by that, Rob. Thank you so much for having me. Was that insensitive? <laughs> <laughs>